I'm a climate scientist. Um, I've just finished a PhD at the British Antarctic Survey and I was looking at the kind of atmospheric causes of melting on this one particular ice shelf on the Antarctic Peninsula, which is the warmest bit of the Antarctic continent and a place that's been warming really, really dramatically in the last half a century or so. But I was looking at things like changing weather patterns, um, cloud composition, the amount of solar radiation that reaches the surface, how all of this kind of affects the amount of melting that we see. So I'm an atmospheric physicist, I'm interested in the kind of atmospheric weather, meteorological climate stuff, but um, then, then how that translates into effects on the actual ice shelf. I was down there in November and December 2017, so summer in the Antarctic, probably the most life-changing thing I've ever done. And it really put everything into context to just see that incredible, pristine environment for yourself. The Arctic is a frozen ocean surrounded by continents and the Antarctic is a frozen continent surrounded by ocean. There's all sorts of very complicated atmospheric circulation effects happening in the Antarctic and it's also very big. <laughs> so these all kind of interact and relate to each other um, and the Arctic is a more simple message. The sea ice is shrinking and contracting and that's exposing more and more dark water to uh, incoming solar radiation which then absorbs it and you get more heating and it feeds back like that. It takes a vast amount of resources to actually go and conduct scientific research in the Antarctic. So we have relatively little data. We have station observations, so people measuring temperature, winds, all of this kind of thing um, from specific points mostly very close to the coast since like 40s, 50s, 60s kind of time. And then we've also got satellites and that was since 1979 onwards. So I use the same computer model that the UK Met Office uses to predict UK weather. And I've been almost forecasting the past, so we call that a hindcast, representing case studies that we know have already happened. And we've got data from weather balloons or surface weather stations or perhaps aircraft campaigns that we can compare it to. And then you can see how well the model simulates these. And then we can use that to understand the processes that are active. Until quite recently, the Antarctic was seen to be relatively stable, apart from in certain sectors, such as the Antarctic Peninsula, which I mentioned, that's warming by around three degrees in the last 60 years. Whereas current research is becoming more aware of changes happening in the Antarctic as well, particularly the West Antarctic. So this is a region that contains enough ice to raise global sea levels by around eight meters, if it were all to melt or collapse. And what's special about this part of the Antarctic is that all the ice shelves and glaciers sit on top of this bedrock that slopes backwards. So what that means is once it goes past a certain, th past a certain threshold, it starts melting and melting and melting and it's almost like a runaway effect where everything starts collapsing and we're seeing really dramatically accelerating glaciers in this region, which indicates that warming is causing lots of melting and that might lead to some kind of catastrophic collapse event. And there's international collaboration happening at the moment that's essentially putting the first scientific observations and scientific research uh, campaigns in this region because previously it's been so remote, we haven't understood what's going on there and it seems like we need to understand it before it disappears. We're already seeing the effects of climate change and those are pretty devastating, particularly for people who are less able to adapt, living in developing countries, near coastlines, um, with limited resources, whose livelihoods are being completely destroyed, even right now. And those impacts are really far-reaching and they're only going to get worse. And the current, I would say, consensus is that we need to act yesterday, preferably, but of course, the sooner we do something, the less horrendous impacts will occur this century and will continue to happen. So I would say that it's definitely an emergency <laughs> and the more we do to prevent it, the better. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which produces these landmark reports every seven years or so um, that summarises the consensus of climate scientists, they produce reports on the causes of climate change, the impacts and mitigation, so how we would find solutions. And there are a huge number of different solutions. 
I mean, the main one is stop causing the climate change in the first place. So reduce emissions and start limiting them from now, completely reduce them to zero, ideally. Also, there are these carbon dioxide removal technologies that industry likes to fixate on because it's a nice technological fix. And then, of course, there's the more kind of grassroots, organisational, systemic changes that we need to see across society. We need to start reducing the amount that we're consuming, particularly in the developed world where we are consuming way more than is probably equitable. We need to start thinking about whether we actually really need those Primark jeans, that new trip to wherever or that new car. Do we actually need those things? I think also a pandemic has cast that in a new light. You don't necessarily need the things you previously thought you needed. We can get by on a, a lot less and have a more rewarding life, I've found anyway. But a focus on individual actions is a real distraction because the people that are really responsible for causing climate change are the government, the institutions, the banks, the insurance industry, you know, all of the corporations that actually directly contribute to climate change. But I will say that it is empowering to take individual action, you know, whatever that means to you. And I think we should all be organising to actually collectively demand that change from those people who are in a position to manifest it. If you're interested in Antarctic science, I would say the British Antarctic Survey website is a really great place to start. There's also a fantastic blog run by a colleague in Wales called Antarctic Glaciers, and that's got the full range of geography and glaciology type blog posts that are really accessible. If you feel like you're up for wrangling a lot of scientific information, then you can have a look at the IPCC website and their reports. They usually have a nice summary that's relatively easy to digest, but um, they are epic monsters if you want to read the full thing. I do lots of explainer videos um, on YouTube. I'm Dr. Gilbs with a Z. There's a guy called Climate Adam who does wicked YouTube videos uh, about all sorts of things related to climate change. And there's huge numbers of people all over Twitter that you can find very easily by searching for things like SciComm um, and climate change. I became a climate scientist because I was a climate activist first and I thought that it was a really great way to learn about our incredible planet. And from what I've learned and from what I know, all I've found is that we really urgently need to make a difference. We really need to turn this ship around. And although changes are happening, they need to happen faster and we all need to get behind them to actually make climate action happen. Mm -hmm.